It is 3 p.m. live from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Jared Blickery today in for Josh Lipton. And this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. We're an hour away from the close of trading and stocks are in rally mode. The top performers, of course, big tech, thanks to Meta, Amazon, NVIDIA. We're breaking down how the moves are rippling across the broader market. And also driving the rally, a blockbuster January jobs report shocking investors. The news taking a rate cut in March even more off the table and turning the narrative of an economic slowdown on its head. We're taking a closer look. But one possible risk for the market, regional banks. New York Community Bank shares losing nearly half of their value this week, raising concerns about the health of the sector nearly a year after the Silicon Valley bank crisis. You'll hear from one analyst later this hour. Let's get you up to speed on the market action. And since Jared is my co-pilot today, indeed, we are at the Yahoo Finance Interactive, um, seeing a strong rally today. Yeah, and you know, except for small caps, but yes. Yeah, I mean, and big cap tech continues to be kind of the driver of the rally here. Yeah, well, we're going to see this in the sector yeah. action. XLC, this was up 6% pr uh, pre-market. It's up 4% now. Meta's up something like 20%. We'll take a look at that in a second. Consumer discretionary, that's Amazon also flying high. I believe Amazon also surpassed Alphabet's market cap for the first time in a few years. Those are the outperformers. And to the downside, utilities, real estate, and material. Real estate and utilities, that is a story about interest rates. Interest rates, guess what? Heading higher today. Yeah, heading higher in those groups tend to come under pressure because, well, they kind of compete Bond dividend yield. Maybe. Right, exactly. And they also, especially when you're talking real estate, they've got a yeah. lot of debt potentially, exactly. which is comes back to the New York Community Bank issue. So let's look at big tech a little bit here, Jared, and, and, and see can, exactly what we're seeing. Sure. Here's a NASDAQ 100. And I was just saying, look at Meta, but yeah. Amazon's really impressive. 8%, 8%. NVIDIA, 5%. Um, let's just pull up a chart of Meta. Yeah. I mean, this is, let's take a look at the year to date because year to date by itself is impressive, 34%. And then the one year, this was the comeback year, <clears throat> up 150%. So just impressive numbers all around, even before today. Yeah, you know, the year of efficiency coming off of that for Meta, now coming into an area where an era where they're still seeing strong ad growth as well. And then, of course, the big cash return to investors in the form of a $50 billion buyback yes. and initiating a dividend, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But, you know, Amazon, uh, you know, maybe not as much of a sort of up, upward surprise for investors, but still a very impressive quarter and outlook coming from that company also. Yeah, and you can see it's approaching its record highs as well. Not quite there just yet, but the others are doing it. I mean, you've got to join the party at some point, you'd think. Yeah, and then I think we should check on Apple as well. I mean, this one has been really bouncing. I think we should look at intraday first sure. because we've seen the big kind of bouncing a few times, sort of little faints that may be going positive and now pretty much unchanged on the day as there was just people weren't that impressed by the numbers. They weren't wowed yeah. in a way that they were wowed, say, by Meta. Yeah, and we came down close to the 200-day moving average, not shown here. You can see we've been green uh, this year so far. This is a year-to-day chart, by the way, uh, but we are still well off those highs that we had a couple years ago. I mean, it is interesting that in the case of Apple, unlike some of the other big tech names, it wasn't like it was rallying huge into the numbers and building up expectations. Right. So it's interesting to see... The sort Expectations of were mine, and that was the reaction. So, yeah, there you interesting go. stuff. All right, let's get to what's going on with the jobs data as well. Of course, that's the other big driver of the market today, showing the economy continues to strengthen. But could this mean that interest rates will stay higher now for longer? Let's welcome in Lauren Goodwin, New York Life Investments economist and chief market strategist, and Julia Pollack, ZipRecruiter chief economist. Uh, Julia, I want to start with you here because we've sort of been puzzling through this all day long why it was so good and why it was so unexpectedly good. Is this is there something about this job market that is just uniquely difficult to predict, Julia? I think it is. I mean, one of the reasons is, is that the labor market is no longer as seasonal as it was before the pandemic. But, you know, December and January came in much stronger than expected, well above trend. Job growth also broadened across industries. And then with these benchmark revisions, 2023 turns out to have been a much stronger year in the labor market than initially reported. Uh, we added 3.1 million jobs over the year. That's kind of a blockbuster number up from previous estimates of 2.7 million. Um, 
That said, there's a caveat on all those numbers, which is that the household survey was negative in both December and January, and over the year, it only shows 1.9 million gains, so much, much weaker. Lauren, and maybe you could touch on this, but first I want to get your big picture thoughts about uh, the, just the blowout number we saw, at least on the headline number this morning in payrolls. I mean, Julia is exactly correct. This is a really strong number, um, not only from the headline perspective, but also in terms of the unemployment rate remaining stable and wage growth being so strong. My main takeaway from an investor's perspective and even from the Fed's perspective is that this is a challenging number for corporate profit margins. We're seeing not only the strong wage growth, which I mentioned, but also hours worked moving lower really quickly. That's a signal potentially that companies are trying to manage these higher labor costs that they've seen over the past couple of years by cutting hours before they get to layoffs. That's pretty typical late economic cycle behavior. And yet, <laughs> we, you know, it, it, in a normal economic cycle, but to Julia's point, you know, this is sort of a tricky time here. So Julia, I guess now what happens next? What can we predict in terms of now the trajectory of the job market? So, you know, when I first saw that hours number, I was also pretty shocked. It, it fell off a cliff. You know, 34.1 hours a week is well outside of the range of what we typically see in a healthy labor market. That said, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has since said, wait, 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 don't get too worried about it. Um, the decline in hours was due to bad weather in the middle of January. So a lot of workers got snow days, and as a result, it pushed the hours number down and the per hour wage estimate up. So that 4.5% wage growth number is not really an accurate reading of what went on. Uh, other data suggests that wage growth has declined three quarters in a row and is actually moving in line with uh, what would be consistent with 2% inflation. Lauren, I'm, I'm interested in what your opinions are about what's going on underneath the surface here. We've seen, not necessarily even in this report, but leading up to this in recent months, we've seen part-time workers increase. We've seen a number of potentially bearish things under the hood that might suggest people are having or have to take on multiple positions, multiple gigs to make their ends meet. Um, and then you take the discrepancies we've seen between the establishment survey, that's with businesses and the households, uh, just talking about that with Julia. What do you think about all of this? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. We are underneath the surface seeing many indicators of what would be really a transition point between what's been a blockbuster labor market and something that might be weakening. You've mentioned um, the, the underlying data, specifically looking at the sectors that have been adding jobs. Um, Julia mentioned that this report is a little bit broader than normal, but we are seeing non-cyclical sectors like education, like healthcare, government jobs, adding the preponderance of, of employment over the past several quarters. We're also, as I, as I mentioned, seeing um, hours worked move pretty steadily lower. These are the types of things that might signal that the labor market is viable to slow moving forward. And we know that the labor market is typically a very lagging, we call it the last economic domino to topple in a cycle. Now, I think the real indicator here that we're looking for next is, what does happen to, cor to corporate profit margins? Do we continue to see pressure from factors like these? Or if we see support via a tax bill, do we actually see an, see an opportunity for profit margins to, to widen? If that's the case, then that would mean less pressure on the labor market. So I think policy has a really important role to play here. Well, and let's talk about monetary policy also, right? What is the, you know, I, I was struck by how unconcerned Jay Powell seemed about the labor market in the press conference the other day. Um, and that, you know, there had been a lot of dire forecasts for what the unemployment rate was going to do late last year that haven't seemed maybe less likely now. I don't know. What do you think? And how do you think the Fed is thinking about labor and how it's going to affect what they do? Well, one thing I know for sure is that the Fed doesn't want to see the unemployment rate rise for the sake of it, right? This is not, um, th that's not their policy goal. Their policy goal is to bring inflation lower. And what Chair Powell mentioned on Wednesday is that we've seen a lot of progress in that direction. I think what's challenging about this report is he said they're looking for more confidence, more evidence, more consistency in the data that we've seen over the last six months or so that's given the market this strong, soft landing narrative. This report does not point in that direction. This is a, a very strong report, and I think the Fed will need to see, um, frankly, different sorts of data to make them feel confident they're closer towards their goals. And Julia, I'll let you uh, close here with your thoughts on the labor market and the Fed as well. 
So until now, uh, until this report, I thought that there was very clear evidence that the labor market was gradually in an orderly fashion sort of slowing and that job growth was also narrowing. This report suggests a reacceleration potentially, uh, and it also shows that we've now hit some interesting milestones. Every major sector has fully recovered from the COVID recession, um, and even tech is starting to grow again. There's a bit of a turnaround in this report in industries that did pretty poorly in 2023. So uh, it's a cautiously optimistic report. Let's look at the inflation data that comes in next week to see where the Fed might move. Um, Lauren, what, do you, what moves, of any, are you making in your portfolios as a result of what you heard today? Well, one of the moves that we've been most confident in over the past couple of months, really, is that whether the Fed is most likely to cut interest rates in March, May, or June, it looks likely that a cut is the next viable path. And so if that's the case, then moving out of cash and cash-like securities where gains have been so strong, especially in the short end of the curve, and moving into corporate bonds where you might able, be able to uh, lock in some of those yields, we think is attractive. Now, of course, this report points on the margin towards that transition happening a little later rather than sooner, but we're still talking about a matter of months rather than quarters. And so that's a, a, a move that we've been gaining confidence in for investors. And Julie, as it turns out, we got time for one more. Um, uh, I'll give you the floor here. We've been talking all about the Labor Department and the labor market. Uh, what else in terms of various uh, economic and macro indicators are you looking at right now? Sure. So at ZipRecruiter, you know, we run monthly surveys of job seekers and of newly hired workers. Those both show a recent improvement. Job seeker sentiment is ticking upwards and new hires are feeling a bit more satisfied with their jobs. Uh, we do hear from many employers that they're still holding back. They expect conditions to improve in the back half of the year, and they're not too confident about investing and expanding until then. But they're still holding on to workers uh, in anticipation that things are going to get better this year, not worse. All right. And we will leave it there. Thank you for joining us, Lauren Goodwin and Julia Pollack. And shares of Exxon and Chevron, they are on the move today after reporting better than expected earnings as the two oil giants double down on fossil fuels. Surprise, surprise. And recent bets on big mergers, they seem to be paying off as both companies uh, saw their, their second highest annual profits in more than a decade. For more on this, we have our own Ines Ferre. Uh, Ines, give us a breakdown here. Yeah, so basically uh, the profits for last quarter, they were down year over year, but they w came in better than expected. And part of this had to do with increased output. So let's throw, you, throw out some of the numbers that came out today with Chevron's adjusted earnings per share coming in at $3.45, beating street estimates by more than 20 cents. The company talking about record annual worldwide and U.S. production with 14% growth here in the U.S. Exxon Mobil Mobile's adjusted earnings per share uh, came in at 2.48 to uh, beat by about 26 cents per share. And Guyana and Permian production, that was up 18 percent. They also saw record annual refinery throughput. Something interesting with Exxon as well, they have been increasing their trading unit um, that came in with a profit of over a billion. Uh, and that offset some of the lower prices that you saw in oil. Remember that last year, WTI was down about 10 percent, more than 10 percent for for the year. So increasing output and that offsets some of the lower oil prices and of course increasing their dividends. So those are some of the takeaways. They increase output, they've been offsetting those lower oil prices and beating street estimates. All yeah, I was struck as well, not only by that they did increase output, but they have plans to keep boosting production yes. as well, which was interesting. You mentioned what's going on with oil prices. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening with oil prices today. We see them down. We've got geopolitical uh, shifts seeing crude fall towards the October lows and you know, pretty big drop there in WTI. Yeah, and down for the week. And part of this has to do with the talk about a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel. And this would really alleviate the situation when it comes to the Red Sea, when it comes to shipments of crude through the Red Sea. And also the talk about China's economic 
uh, growth. The IMF just came out with their report about housing demand and how that's going to be down and how their uh, forecast for China growth is for that to slow. And so that lower GDP forecast is also weighing on the markets. But I would say that a lot of what you're seeing is the reaction to the talk about a ceasefire and what that will do to sort of free up that uh, shipping uh, lane, those shipping lanes through the Red Sea area as well. Yeah, Ines, thank you. We'll keep an eye on all of that action. Appreciate it. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, MediShare soaring today after the company issued its first ever dividend. We'll tell you the reasoning behind the move and explain to you why companies play dividends in the first place. Apple rolling out its Vision Pro mixed reality goggles today. While demand is there, can the latest device help boost the stock? Plus, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to get analyst insight on two stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stick around. More Yahoo Finance still to come. Meta making headlines with the announcement of its first ever dividend. The news, along with the company's strong earnings and guidance, sending shares soaring toward a record high in today's trade. Meta is now on track to add $200 billion to its market cap. That would be the biggest single-day addition for any company on record. So why did this dividend announcement hype up investors so much? Let's take a step back and cover the basics. What 
is a dividend is the first thing we want to talk yes. about. Uh, it's a, a regular payment made by a company to the folks who own the stock. Meta's dividend is going to be paid quarterly at 50 cents a share. It's considered a vote of confidence from CEO Mark Zuckerberg, and he's set to be himself yes. the biggest big beneficiary. Owns a lot of shares, and yeah. he holds roughly 350 million shares of Meta, so his payout is about $175 million each quarter, that's before taxes, and that's about $700 million every single year, assuming that dividend stays the, stay, stays the same. This move is also notable because big tech doesn't necessarily do dividends, and this has been the case throughout history, although some of the bigger ones, they do end up doing that. Companies with extra cash generally have three options of what they can do with it. Number one, they can reinvest it in the business, doing research and development, buying equipment or factories, hiring new workers, Number two, they can make an acquisition or acquisitions. Three, they can pay out some of that cash to shareholders, either as a dividend or by buying back their shares, which reduces the number of shares outstanding and it boosts the value for the existing shareholders. It's basically an extra reward for owning the stock. And Julie, we were talking about not only not only is there a dividend here, it's a $50, $50 billion exactly. buyback announcement, but that's not the first $50 billion announcement that they've done before. No. They actually did one two years ago in 2021. Yeah, so. it was sort of that, the one-two punch of that with the dividend. Yes that really caused so much enthusiasm. But in fact, only three of the Magnificent Seven stocks pay out dividends right now. Most of them have historically chosen options one and two. Either they spend their cash on the business or to buy other businesses, or in the case of Apple, they also just have a lot of cash yes. left over that sits around. But Meta's move does send a message. That's what these are sort of designed to do. The company has enough cash that it's confident it can both invest in the future and share profits with shareholders, and also maybe that it's not going to be making big acquisitions. Maybe right. it's a signal of that as well. Well, and they'd be under the radar for that anyway, but not yeah. to say that they wouldn't yeah. do it. Right. But the traditional way tech has rewarded shareholders is through share buybacks. Meta is authorizing another $50 billion buyback last night. And yes, that is a huge headline number, as we've been talking about. Nowhere near the biggest ever tech has seen, though. Apple holds the crown for that top five buybacks authorized. So all five of the top ones are Apple. You go all the way up to $100 billion. Yeah. That is substantial. That's a cash problem. Yes, and that, in, indeed, that you know, Apple is known for having a lot of cash. Yeah. And it's known for spending a lot of cash as well for that particular usage. Well, speaking of Apple, Apple's Vision Pro hitting shelves today with CEO Tim Cook marking the launch at the company's flagship store right here in New York City on Fifth Avenue. It is Apple's first major new category since 2015 with a price tag of nearly $3,500. It's coming on the heels of earnings, of course, last night, but the stock has been edging lower, really bouncing around due to weakness in China. It is well off its lows of the day. Let's bring in Gil Luria, DA Davidson Managing Director, to talk more about this. Hey, Gil, good to see you. Um, good to see you. Let's start with the Vision Pro, and then we can sort of broaden it out to the earnings. $3,500. Cool product by most of the reviewers. That's what they, they're saying. What does this, what does the Vision Pro do for Apple? Well, the first thing it does is it changes perceptions about Apple's ability to innovate. We haven't had a new product category in a while, and this is a very big new uh, innovation. It will change how we do computing. Uh, spatial computing is very different than how we do it now, how we interact with applications, how we view what we're seeing, where the battery is, where the display is. So it's Apple taking us way out into the future for now at a price point that most folks can't afford, but will give at least some people a, a perspective on where things are headed, especially so developers can develop the new applications and tools that are more appropriate for spatial computing. Uh, Gil, maybe I'm just reading into this personally, but I see the pictures with uh, Tim Cook and the new headset on. He doesn't look the happiest. And, <laughs> you know, I go back. Johnny Ive was really never into AR and VR. I'm not sure he would have endorsed this. In fact, he left Apple before this was really developed. I'm just wondering if there's something there, if, if you think people inside Apple are really gung-ho about this. Well, again, the point is, this isn't what we're going to have in, on our head in five years. Nobody is going to have this heavy, clunky device that has an external battery and weighs a pound and has multiple straps that needs to be adjusted. That's not what it's going to look like in five years. In five years, it's just going to be glasses. We're just going to have glasses. 
that that we can see um, uh, the uh, our surroundings. We can see multiple um, multiple screens and multiple applications at once. And that's how uh, we're going to use this device. It's not going to look like the big ski goggles that they are today. Gil, um, can we assume even as this spatial computing innovation is happening mm -hmm. that like the iPhone is kind of innovated out, right? It's got like the, are we going to see any more leaps of innovation in smartphones or with the existing technologies of pretty much as far as it's going to go? Well, I think there's a few more opportunities for innovation. So phones can still get uh, lighter, thinner, um, maybe transparent. F some other uh, handset makers make them uh, foldable. But uh, what I would really look out for is Apple is going to introduce new generative AI capabilities, most likely in, in the June WWDC event. And they might tie it to the next iPhone cycle. So they may make the iPhone 16 be the only handset that can run these types of applications. And if that's the case, we'll have a major upgrade cycle. The last time we had a major upgrade cycle was the iPhone 12. That was the first phone that was capable of getting on a 5G network. If they make a, a phone that's the first and only phone that can operate something that that consumers want, such as generative AI capabilities, that may drive another upgrade cycle. Got to ask you about China because that has been a sore spot, not only for Apple, but for the entire uh, exporting world for that matter. Um, what do you think the future is for Apple specifically in China? We have very little visibility. The, the outlook is murky uh, because there's so many factors that contribute to performance in China. First and foremost, the Chinese consumer, the, the economy there is weak, the market's weak, the real estate market's weak, the sources of wealth are dissipating for that high-end Chinese consumer. Then you have, it's the most competitive handset market with a, a, a local incumbent that, that is very price competitive, but also has some rich features that they're introducing. And then finally, you have the government uh, deciding how protectionist they want to be. There's reports out of China that they're not allowing um, government-backed agencies uh, for people that work in those types of agencies to have iPhones, possibly as a retaliation around our measures in, in limiting AI chips, possibly as part of a bigger political uh, statement. Either way, those are things that are going to be very hard for Apple to predict. It's going to continue to be in that market. In fact, they had the highest share in, in China last year still with all of this. But it's going to be very hard to predict what's going to happen to that going forward. Um, Gil, you mentioned um, AI in passing, right? And Tim Cook sort of teased that something is coming from the company on the AI front. I mean, Apple does tend to leak a little bit. Maybe we'll get a little more insight into what it might be. But I mean, do you have any theories? And I guess three part question. Do you have any theories? When do you think we'll learn more? And what is that going to do for Apple? Well, so it's usually not Apple that's leaking. It's their, they have such a broad supply chain that just that somebody somewhere and a vendor of Apple's is usually the person who's leaking it. Apple actually tries really hard not to front run its product just so there, because there's so much speculation. And that's what they're doing here. Um, all we know for now is that there are uses of AI already. When when, uh, when we use our text to, and they auto-complete a text, that's, that's a use of AI. Um, you could expect that to expand from there. But based on the resources they have and the attention they're focused on and, and how important it is for their future, I would expect some things that we're not thinking about yet to come out later this year uh, to make the experience better, to help us summarize experiences, pre-populate messages, and, and possibly help more with translation, um, either to language or to, or to programming or to application maneuvering. There's a lot of things they can do. And again, they have so many resources, so many uh, smart people working in, in Cupertino that I would expect them to do something that will impress us. Gil, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, checking in on some of today's top trending tickers. We mentioned it in passing earlier. NVIDIA shares are jumping uh, by almost 5%. Bank of America raising its price target to 8 
$1,200 a share with expectations the chipmaker is going to top expect earnings expectations later this month. It doesn't report until February 21st. So just when everybody sort of calms down a little bit mm -hmm. from earnings season, then you get the big NVIDIA report. Um, and they're talking a lot about the dominance, um, that is the um, analysts over at Bank of America, that NVIDIA has in AI inference and in the chips that power um, all of this learning that yes. AI is doing effectively. They said, we expect NVIDIA to hold a 90% share, share in training and achieve a more than 50% share in inference. So still, and I think that Bank of America is probably not alone here. There are a lot of folks we've talked to who say NVIDIA is just still going to dominate in this area. Yeah, and then the question is then, uh, how much more dominance, how much more dominant can they become? Um, they already have a huge market share of the bleeding edge here. And then Bank of America, I think they're kind of not walking back, but they're mitigating some of their very bullish comments saying, while NVIDIA's upcoming results may show a smaller upside surprise in past quarters and perhaps disappoint some bulls, the more measured pace will also be seen as creating a more fertile ground for continued growth. So they're looking at it as a positive that we're not going to see this explosive gro growth in the interim, mm -hmm. that they're going to take a more measured pace. And uh, we'll have to see how that pans out there. But nevertheless, yeah. NVIDIA up 33 percent. I was just looking at this on the Wi-Fi mm -hmm. Interactive. That's this year alone. Uh, reminds me of last year. <laughs> and we got to talk about AbbVie. Shares of AbbVie higher today after topping fourth quarter earnings expectations and issuing stronger than expected profit guidance for the fiscal year 2024. I do have this up on the Wi-Fi Interactive. Just want to quote, just want to chart this real quickly. Um, here is a five-year chart. Let me put some lines on here. And you can see it's right at the upper end of a trading range we've had over the last two years. So this particular earnings was not enough to be a catalyst to catapult it out of here. Um, so we're going to need another one or we might do some mean reversion there. Yeah, and it looks like the long-term sales forecast for particular drugs boosting, that's something that the company was, um, that I should say investors were happy about. Something else caught my eye yes. related to the commentary around this. And this is something that AbbVie is looking at in the future. AbbVie makes Botox. They oh. sell Botox. And they're talking about the so-called Ozempic face. Um, people who take these new weight loss drugs, there's this effect that has been chronicled on social media that with the loss of fat and tone, yes. people kind of droop. And so they're saying that the demand for Botox related to that is going to be a long-term tailwind. Yeah, not only that, then you can go overboard on that and also fillers, and then you're going to need another treatment for that. Uh, we see how this plays out in medicine all the time. I guess we do. All right, let's talk about another mover. That is Spotify. Those shares getting a little bit of a pop here. On the back of news that the music and podcast streamer has reached a new deal with star podcaster Joe Rogan. That deal reportedly worth as much as $250 million over its multi-year term. This according to the Wall Street Journal. It also includes a revenue sharing agreement based on ad sales. Um, the journal also talks about how Spotify has changed its strategy a little yes. bit away from sort of exclusive deals. Right. I think that's important, too. Um, but, you know, Joe Rogan got paid a lot of money, and now that he's able to branch out, he's going to probably make some more in terms of royalties, and it could also be a win for Spotify. So there's that. Um, and then this line caught my eye in a Bloomberg article um, just talking about the size of the deal. At $300 million, podcasting was roughly 2% of 22 revenue for Spotify, but Spotify expects it to reach $20 billion. Well, there's a huge gap there. I mean, that's that's an enormous gap. So this is still, I'm not going to say it's a moonshot bet. I'm, sur I'm sure Joe Rogan's paying a lot of bills for them. But I don't think that podcasting in general is, is nearly the uh, win that they thought it was going to be five years ago. I mean, how many cans of Athletic Greens can you sell? <laughs> I, I Apparently don't. more. As with some of them being sold to my household, but that's another story entirely. All right. Well, coming up, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to get analysts inside to help you make the best choices for your portfolio.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're taking a look at food stocks. Which companies are worth putting in your cart and which are best left on the shelf? I'm here with John Baumgartner, Mizuho Managing Director of Equity Research. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Julie. So let's get into it and talk about your buy, which is a, a name that perhaps is not as well known, I would say, in the US. It's Nomad, huge European frozen food brands it owns. Um, the stock has had kind of a rocky year, but let's get into why you like it here. And let's start with the potential return to volume growth. As we know, a lot of companies in the food sector have had volumes down as prices have gone up. That's right, Nomad's the largest branded frozen food manufacturer in Europe, $3 billion uh, in retail sales focused on frozen fish, frozen pizza, frozen vegetables. Private label share is double in Europe what it is here in the US, mm -hmm. but it hadn't grown in over a decade. Until about 12 to 18 months ago, with cost inflation coming through, Nomad priced it at retail, you started seeing volume declines, market share losses to private label. Uh, just in the fourth quarter of 2023, we saw a reinvestment cycle back into the business, mm -hmm. more advertising, more in-store promotion, and we're seeing brands responding, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, you're seeing fish really so inflecting positively in Q4, there. and vegetables are also following. So that's not priced into the stock for 2024. We think you will get back to volume growth for the first time in three years, and that should drop to numbers and the stock. Interesting, okay, so let's also talk about um, a multi-year cost savings that you're looking for at this company. How is that kind of feeding through? So Nomad has grown through acquisitions over much of the past decade. And with that, we see opportunities for factory consolidation, increases in capacity utilization, overhead cost savings as well. That's not factored. And we estimate those cost savings could drive over 200 basis points of annual growth operating profit in each of the next few years. Again, not priced into shares here, which could your upside you know, as, as far as uh, 2025. And then finally, um, there's cash return to shareholders too. There's a new dividend coming from this company. Yeah, when you look at Nomad, it, it's it's what you think of in a Hallmark staple food stock. Stable growth, one to 2% top line mid single digit operating profit growth, double digit EPS growth, has not paid a dividend, has preferred share uh, repurchase over the past four or five years. Uh, just on Monday, we've now seen uh, the first cash dividend being paid, a 3% yield. We think that opens up the stock to income oriented shareholders for the first time that have not been in this name. It trades at eight, eight and a half times profit, 30% discount relative to the food stock. So we think that will drive upset the numbers as well. I mean, I have to think of Meta because we keep talking about Meta's new dividend today, but you know, there's other exciting stuff happening with dividends in smaller companies too. Let's talk about the risk though, because obviously there's a lot going on in Europe geopolitically, also consumer pressures and economic pressures. So how, how much of a concern is that? The largest risk is, is geopolitics. I mean, this is a European-based name. We had the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict emerge in 2022. Uh, there was a big risk off in European equities and given the most of the shareholder base for Nomad is in the US, this stock saw even more pressure. Stock was cut in half uh, between February and October of 2022. Still has not fully recovered those losses. So number one would be geopolitics in Europe that would give us you know, caution on the name. Okay, well, let's get to the one that you do not like. And this is a stock that's already fallen quite a bit. I'm talking about Beyond Meat here. I think the shares are down more than 60% in the last year. They came public, what, at 25? Now they're trading below seven. Right. But even with that big drop, you don't like Beyond Meat. And let's talk about why here. First of all, the sales pressure that we've seen on the category overall, if you look at the meat category volume. Yeah, I mean, we think plant-based meat has been the most disappointing category in the past three years. Uh, there's a lot of excitement back at the IPO in 2019, which we thought was, was excessive at the time. Uh, but COVID hit in 2020, you saw the spike in retail sales for the category, it provided more of a false sense of demand growth for this category overall. Now you've seen three straight years of volume declines uh, at the high level. Uh, and the problem that we see in this name right now is it's, it's more about limited portfolio. You think about the category, it's mostly ground beef substitutes, sausage substitutes, and 60% of consumers are actually buying plant-based meat for other categories other than beef, whether it's chicken, pork, seafood, uh, even non-meat, pasta, pizza. Uh, there's different substitution factors that are here that the portfolio is not catering to, and we think this is a problem for the category going forward in 2024. So that's interesting. You're saying the problem is not plant-based proteins. The problem is that they don't offer enough different types of plant-based proteins. That's right. It's a very, very narrow portfolio right now for the category. Um, and then there's, as you say, there's competition, and that means that, that Beyond Meat is going to have to advertise. If you look, for example, at It versus Impossible, 
there's a clear correlation between com competition coming in and losing market share. There is. I mean, the companies now, you know, it, it came of age from the, the IPO cycle of, you know, really growth at any cost, focus on the top line. Um, what we're seeing now is a reversion to a reinvestment cycle. But our concern is advertising will have very low returns. Because again, the portfolio is not broad enough to incorporate more households, more consumers. And our concern is even though you're reinvesting back into the business, it's not going to drive an inflection in sales. And it's just going to reduce profitability even more. And that then brings us to the last point, which is you're concerned about the balance sheet? That's right. Uh, you know, growth at any cost, you know, for the first couple of years, the company was even burning over $100 million in cash per quarter in 2021, 2022. They've gone through multiple reductions of costs at this point, but we still think they'll burn 20 to $40 million of cash per quarter in 2024. They had $220 million in cash in the balance sheet at Q3. So our concern is you cut too much, you starve the ability to grow to begin with. So we think there's limits to how much cash burn can improve this year. That being said, uh, you know, we do expect some capital raise before the end of the year, whether it's expensive debt or equity that's very dilutive to shareholders. It's something to watch for, uh, for negative risk. Yeah, all right. What could go right for Beyond Meat? That's a pretty grim picture. Yeah. Maybe suddenly we see sales stabilize. What would cause that to happen? Well, I mean, you think at some point you just base out in terms of demand. It just stops falling. Uh, we don't see signs of that right now, but that would be the biggest opportunity for stabilization for the P&L because the sale stabilized, the cost reduction stabilized, the cash burn stabilizes, and that's where you get a turnaround in sentiment in the numbers. But as I said, for right now, we don't see the makings of that stabilization anytime soon. Okay. And do you have any position in either of these things? Uh, do not. Do okay. Not. All right. Let's sum it up then. Okay. Uh, what uh, we're so telling investors is buy Nomad Foods for its potential for a return to volume growth, cost savings as well, a new cash dividend. On the other side, you're saying avoid Beyond Meat for continued sales pressure, costly advertising reinvestments, and liquidity challenges. John, That's thanks right. so much. Thanks, Appreciate Julie. it. And thank you so much for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll be bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back.
Shares of New York Community Bank Corp tanking over the last couple days after the bank said it's dealing with losses from commercial real estate loans. This following a similar crisis with regional banks like Silicon Valley Bank last year. And for more insight on this and to see if this is a continuing trend for the regional banks, we're talking to Wedbush Securities Managing Director of Equity Research, David Cheverini. David, thank you for joining us here today. Um, what what is the scope of this problem? I think when when we see things like this, uh, not a huge bank, but people are always wondering what the knock on effects are and what's hidden underneath the surface. Yeah, so I would say this is idiosyncratic to New York Community Bank, and the reason for that is at least what I see as the problem areas for New York Community is their office, you know, portfolio is four percent of loans, but uh, another troubled area at least in our view, is rent-regulated multifamily. And those loans make up 22% of New York Community's uh, loan portfolio, whereas most of the rest of the regional banks don't have anywhere close to that level of rent-regulated multifamily exposure. So I do expect this to stay mostly contained to New York Community. Now, as we progress through 2024, it's not to say that the banking industry won't have issues to contend with. Commercial real estate will be an issue, but I think it'll be managed better at some of the other banks versus New York Community with these problem areas. Um, David, and I, I do want to talk more broadly about the sector, but I do have one uh, another question about New York Community specifically. I mean, the thing that really seemed to take investors off, off guard was by how much it increased its reserves. But as you point out in your note reacting to it, its reserve to loan ratio is still below peers. So do you think that they should even have set aside more in reserves? Yeah, I do think they should have set aside more in reserves because last year they did have the fortunate um, position of having a $2 billion bargain purchase gain when they acquired the Signature Bank portfolio and, and the deposits from the FDIC. They should have, in hindsight being 2020, should have built reserves to offset a portion of that gain right in the second quarter. But what they did in increasing their reserves, so from a a whole holistic standpoint, the reserve to loan ratio went to 1.17. The group is more like 1.4 to 1.5, so they're shy there. But the other area, drilling in on multifamily, they took the reserve from 40 basis points to 80 basis points. But based on our calculations, they should have taken it up to 2.4%. Um, so we do think that they're under-reserved related to the rent-regulated multifamily portfolio. And David, could you talk to us big picture about specifically how um, the commercial real estate market is different from, say, the mortgage-backed security market that we see for private housing? And they develop on, the problems develop on very different timelines, lots of different factors involved. With commercial, you have these leases that are 10 years, but how, can you kind of give us an appreciation for how long it takes for these problems to surface? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Um, the maturity schedule for these loans is drawn out. It's not like they're all going to mature over the next six months or 12 months. It's more we're talking in terms of you know multiple years. So that's what should enable the banks to manage the issue. Will it be a headwind? Yes. Will they have to increase you know provisions over the next few years? Um, yes. But it should be manageable. Now, could we see some, you know, banks stumble on it? Yes, we think New York community is, is one of them, but we think it should be manageable for the most part because of, as you noted, it being spread out over time as opposed to very much in, in the near term. And on mortgage-backed securities, that's more of an interest rate risk issue, uh, given that uh, most mortgages, of course, are fixed rate loans, and that gets reflected in the, in the pricing of, the, of those bonds that are trading, you know, still underwater from where they were a couple of years ago. Is there any scenario where that would be sort of a perfect storm for um, some of these portfolios? I mean, you know, would it have to do with rates going up abruptly, for example, or no, because most of these, you know, the maturities are gradual of these particular loans? Is there anything else that you're worried about, I guess is what I'm asking, David? Yeah, well, the perfect storm would be you know, inflation not getting to the Fed's 2% target, so the Fed stays higher for longer. And then the other part of that perfect storm scenario is going into a recession. So if we have a situation where the economy is slowing, 
and rates are staying you know higher for longer um, because of higher you know inflation being sticky that would make it very difficult for these borrowers to be able to withstand the higher rates when their loans come up for renewal so it's really repricing risk um, that is one of the main risks with commercial real estate david always really appreciate uh, your perspective on these issues thanks so much my pleasure thanks the market's reaction to jobs report showing that good news is good news, even though the first rate cut likely won't be happening in March. Josh Schaefer is here with more. And I guess that's sort of a surprise, right? Because the, when we've gotten sort of hits to the idea that a rate mm -hmm. cut was coming sooner rather than later, the mar equity market didn't like that. Yeah, normally this, has, this hasn't been the trend that we've seen at least, you know, the past six months, year, probably year and a half, that really since we started this rate hike cycle, right? But I think one thing that was interesting today that I was looking at, we're no longer looking at March for a rate cut, but when we zoom out at what we're pricing in for rate cuts for 2024, the narrative hasn't actually changed that much. So if you look at what investors were pricing in for the full year for 2024, in October versus what we, they were pricing in in December. That orange line there, the dark orange line, was basically as dovish as we got. That was right after the December Fed meeting. And now when you look yellow, it's pretty much the same thing. And when I talked to the equity strategy team at Goldman Sachs, they said that's kind of the point here. Our narrative hasn't shifted. It was never about March or May or really even June. Look at what our economics team is still forecasting. The overall outlook for the economy hasn't changed, and we're still going to get that easing, and that's why we're still positive on stocks. And I thought that that was rather, rather insightful, honestly, when thinking about this overall, because you're right, Julie. Normally, we would see something like the wage growth this morning and say, oh, boy, oh, boy, here comes maybe not, not necessarily another hike at this point, but at least more tightening, and that is not really what the market is reading today. Mm. Josh, you just wrapped a yo person's work uh, doing the chart book for us, yeah. and this is something we begun last year. In terms of the labor market, I know that you got a couple charts in there on it. Um, anything informative to the discussion that we're having today with respect to rate cuts or just the labor market in general? Yeah, I think there was a couple things, Jared, that stuck out. I mean, one chart that we had from Ryan Dietrich uh, that we put in our Yahoo Finance uh, live blog today that's following the market online, you can check it out there, was talking about productivity. And essentially, productivity picked up in the last two quarters. A lot of people think productivity is still picking up this quarter. And if you have productivity picking up with those higher wages, it would be less of an inflation risk, which I found rather insightful. And another chart, Jared, less yes. to do with the labor market, but it's from our friend Sam Rowe over at Ticker. And I want to take a look Beautiful. at that because it does have to do with why people are still positive on stocks. This is a very simple chart. We've all seen it a million times. It's just projections for S&P 500 earnings. And when you take a look at 2024 and 2025, we're still projecting earnings to go up. And until that narrative changes, you're probably not going to see some of the more bullish strategists on Wall Street become a little bit more bearish. It has to do with what we were talking about with the economy, right? Mm -hmm. You need the economy to start slowing for people to then say, OK, now we're worried about earnings because the economy isn't growing and it works in that cyclical nature. If the economy is growing, those earning estimates are going to be up, which means people think stocks will be right. up. Right. I mean, although we did talk to, not everybody thinks that, right? I mean, of look, course. we talked to Lauren Goodwin earlier from New York Life, mm. and she said she's concerned that we're going to see profit margins start to contract mm. here. Um, but I also was looking at some commentary from Austin Goolsby, yep. uh, the Chicago Fed president who spoke to the Wall Street Journal. And he, like many, like Lauren among them, talked to the hours worked mm -hmm. as really maybe a signal of weakness underlying the report. And so I just wonder how all these strategists are looking at that as a leading indicator, perhaps. Yeah, so hours work went from 34.3 to 34.1, right? A, a move and certainly a move down, but some people look at it and say, well, it's one month. Let's see what happens in February. Right. January is kind of a weird seasonal month with a lot of things, including wages. So people are sort of trying not to look too far into that. So I think when it comes to the little signs of cooling, with 353,000 jobs added, people are just sort of like, Let's wait until February and get a little bit the more. The bears data. need okay. something. We got to yeah. give them something. You got to cling to something, Jared. Yeah. You got the market at record <laughs> highs. Right. Right? Thank Someone. you for stopping by here, Josh Schaefer. Coming up on the closing bell on Wall Street, we are going to check the latest market moves in the top trending tickers. Stay tuned.
There's the closing bell on Wall Street, uh, closing out the day and the week for the major averages. Let's do a check of the markets here. We did have all three major averages closing near the highs of the session, right? The Dow, uh, the laggard of the three major averages today, up about a third of 1%, 134 points. The S&P gaining about 1%, up 52 points. And the NASDAQ, the leader today, one and three quarters of a percent. Um, and Jared, um, mm -hmm. obviously the NASDAQ doing the best of the three because it's got large cap tech, which was doing well today thanks to Amazon and Meta. We see the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ 100 hitting new highs yes. again. The trifecta today. yet again. Um, it's the sixth or seventh time for the S&P 500 this year. Don't quote me on that, but I'm gonna do a, a weekly recap later, but let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive real uh, briefly so we can see what has happened today. And this is quite the picture. Amazon up 8%, almost Nvidia up five, Meta up 20. Haven't seen anything like that in, well, probably a few earnings seasons. And it does happen with some of these stocks. Um, it was only last year is actually last Groundhog's Day that we saw Meta up even more, a greater percentage. So interesting to see that play out. Yeah, and can I interrupt yes. you for two seconds here just to confirm um, a superlative that we talked about before, which is the, the amount of market value that Meta alone added today yes. was $197 billion That's a record. when all was said and done, which is indeed the biggest gain in market history. Yeah. Apple, beating out Apple because they had that record before. So that is impressive. Yeah. And uh, just real quickly on the sector action, not surprisingly, communication services was in the lead, up 4%. That is, uh, you know, that's that meta story right there. And then, yeah. and then consumer discretionary as well to our performers. All right, well, we gotta get to a couple trending tickers. Gen Digital, shares dropping after missing third quarter estimates and slashing its fiscal 2024 revenue guidance. And Julie, this is a stock that I understand you're going to educate me on. I am, okay, right. because my, some people might've looked at this stock, which was the worst performer, or one of the worst performers in the S&P 500 today. It was trending on our Yahoo Finance trending ticker page and said, what the heck is Gen Digital? Well, I'm going to tell you what Gen Digital is. It is a cybersecurity company that was formerly known as Norton LifeLock. Uh, remember, that yes. was sort of a combination of the Broadcom bought the enterprise security um, division from Symantec, named it Norton LifeLock, which is also sort of the brand name, mm -hmm. right? That if you're a consumer and you're getting a cybersecurity software, sometimes it has the brand Norton. So that's what company. Then it merged with a company called Avast in September of 2022 and became Gen Digital. So yes. it's a cybersecurity company here. But uh, uh, to your point, one, uh, the disappointed investors with its uh, numbers here and a lot of um, um, analysts pointing to uh, lower ARPU here, lower average revenue per user as the issue. Yes, that was what I was taking away from some of the analyst commentary mm -hmm. that I was looking at. And let's take a look at the Wi-Fi Interactive real quickly. Um, this is a max chart. This goes back to, it looks like late 80s, early 90s. Um, but this is just, look at this, 20 years of chop. Let me put a 20 year mm -hmm. chart. And you can see we are right in the middle of the, of the range there, but I've, I've seen my, my sinusoidal Heartbeat uh, <laughs> looks very similar to that on an EKG, Julie. Well, I guess that's because the company changed too in terms yeah, of like being... Semantic might be in there. It's yeah. always interesting how these mergers affect the stock history. Yes, most definitely. Let's talk about Charter Communications. The stock having its biggest single drop on record with that 16.5% drop after it missed quarterly profit estimates and posted a surprise drop in broadband subscribers as well. Um, basically... There's a lot of competition in this area, um, and Charter is suffering as a result. Uh, it lost 61,000 internet customers last quarter. A year earlier, it had mm -hmm. gained 105,000. Uh, cable TV customers, it also lost customers there. So all of that contributing to the declines. Yeah. There's a reason these guys pay dividends in telecommunications, mm -hmm. so people own the stock. I do have a couple of analyst uh, quotes here. This is Wells Fargo Securities. They rate the stock in overweight with a price target of 460. They say broadband users uh, worse than expected while average revenue per user, that's ARPU, came in weaker as well. The negative subtrend is not itself a surprise, but the extent of sub losses is arguably a bit worse than street expectations. And then vital knowledge real quick. The broadband number, quote, is weak and will receive a lot of attention. And I think we just did that.
Yes. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> Decker shares, they are surging after the UGG maker raises its 2024 outlook. Company also seeing record profit and revenue in the third quarter. And this is a stock, um, I do have a couple of analyst notes here, mm -hmm. but I just want to quote TD Cowan, and I'll let you go here. They rate the stock and outperform. The execution of Decker's across channels, geographies, and categories is sector best. And just walking around New York, I see lots of Ugg boots. Yeah, I was going to ask you, are you an Ugg guy? Do you have any Uggs? I, I would never. I think I've Not only personally. seen you in Vans. Pretty much. Yeah. Vans uh, they, and dress shoes. They also make Hoka's, which are yes. um, a, a big a big hit in my household. Not by me, but by my husband. I don't know how many. I've lost count of how many pairs of Hoka's he has at this point. Um, and a lot of the analysts there are talking about um, that Uggs continue to be popular. Hoka's continue to grow. Uh, there's another announcement we should mention uh, from Deckers as well. They're going to be getting a new CEO. The CEO, David Powers, is going to retire in August. Chief Commercial Officer Stefano Corotti will be, has been named his successor here. So um, that uh, also affecting the shares most likely yep. in today's session. Let's talk treasuries, shall we? The 10-year treasury yield seeing its biggest one-day jump since 2022 in today's trade, surging past 4% after this morning's jobs report. That hotter-than-expected labor data could complicate the Fed's path forward and prove problematic for investors who had been betting on rate cuts in early 2024. With more, we're joined by Chip Huey, Truist Wealth Managing Director of Fixed Income. Hey, Chip, good to see you here. Big, big move, hey, big, big move in those uh, treasuries today on that surprise report here. When you're looking strategically at now at sort of how to play the Fed and rates this year, did today meaningfully change how you're calculating that? Yeah, I think that the jobs report that, that we saw to, that we saw come in uh, really validated something that we've kind of been thinking and that the Fed was not going to be as quick to move uh, with Fed rate cuts as the market was anticipating, right? We saw anticipation really build around the idea that the Fed would uh, would begin cutting rates in March. We think it's more probable that it probably kicks off sometime during the summer months. So you're seeing yields recalibrate for that. And also as part of that jobs report, you know, you saw the growth in, in wages really come in very strong. And so that could have that sort of wage push inflation concerns kind of come back into the forefront that the Fed is trying to combat. So you're seeing a recalibration for Fed expectations and also maybe a little bit of concern about uh, stickier inflation as a result. Well, and Chip, when we think about the factors that affect the bond market and interest rates, we also got something that uh, affects the Treasury term premium, and that is the Treasury quarterly refunding announcement. And I don't think it got a lot of press because it was fairly as expected, but there's tons of details. And I was just wondering if you could talk broadly about how all the Treasury supply coming online, the increased need for the government, the U.S. government to borrow, how that affects uh, your case for interest rates. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that was all the rage back in the fall of last year. It was yes. all concerns about about supply and debt issuance. And really, the Fed pivot really took that away. Right. That, that we stopped. We stopped kind of you know, thinking about that. There was some relief in that it appears that uh, we, we did see quarterly refundings grow larger for the, the current quarter. But there was also the comment that perhaps they would not need to continue to grow throughout the rest of this year, that that size would stay stable. So there was some relief there. I think that there is that sort of wild card aspect out there uh, that has to do with these uh, tax cut uh, packages that are being debated in D.C. That could bring back the discussions around needing greater issuance to fill in these growing deficits. And so I would not be surprised that as the Fed you know, right now is on center stage, perhaps kind of takes a, a step back if the focus like we saw in the fall doesn't go to what you're talking about, which is you know, how much supply will we actually issue by the end of this year? So at the end of the day, are we looking at the, you know, we kind of were at higher for longer for a while. Then that seemed to shift. Are we back to higher for longer? I, th I think so. We do expect the Fed to lower interest rates this year. I just think they're going to be very cautious and move very slowly. And I think that's really what Fed Chairman Powell was really trying to say on Wednesday, is that I don't think that the evidence is going to be there in time for the March meeting. And so today's jobs report you know, plays into that. So I do think that we will see the Fed lower rates this year, but it will be done in a very measured way and likely kick off a, a little a little later uh, than the market was expecting. We saw we saw the market pricing in six plus cuts starting as early as March. That was a 90% probability of a start in March. And we were never really there. Uh, we think it's more, it's more in the sort of three to four rate cut camp kicking off more towards mid-year. 
And Chip, before we go, got to ask you about QT, quantitative tightening, and the potential wind down of the Fed's program of lowering its balance sheet, letting those bonds run off. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about it, and the, what's the wiggle room for the Fed? I know that there's a huge pool of cash, maybe six, seven hundred billion dollars in the reverse repo pool, and we can right. get really in the weeds here. But how much wiggle room does the Fed have with respect to QT left? Yeah, based on the liquidity metrics that you're talking about, we kind of think that QT uh, will definitely become more and more discussed and more publicly discussed as we move into the next couple of meetings. We do expect the, the Fed to start slowing QT uh, within the next few meetings or so uh, and, and, and then allow the, and then potentially step down that pace uh, as the year as the year progresses. But in reality, the Fed would like to see the balance sheet continue to come down a bit. So we don't we don't necessarily think that it would be a, a quick stop to QT, but it would not surprise us at all to see quantitative tightening begin to slow uh, around the time that really the first sort of rate cut discussions really, uh, really kind of kick up in earnest. All right, that does it for us right now, Chip. But uh, thank you for stopping by and thanks for your insights. Thank you. Coming up, we are continuing our week-long series, Options 101. We're going to help investors navigate the mathematical complexities of trading options, making the best move for their portfolios. Stay tuned. More Yahoo Finance after this.
Ford is reporting a solid start to the year as U.S. sales jump in January. Meanwhile, the automaker's electric vehicle sales paint a dimmer picture. Here with the details, Yahoo Finance's Pras Subramanian. Pras, I guess not surprising on the electric vehicle side. That's been a tough well, place for everybody, well, it feels like. Well, I, I think that the general trend is that the, the sales have been growing, but not as fast okay. as people thought. But in this case, Ford had a great month. 4.3% uh, sales jump compared to last year, uh, about 152,000 vehicles, 10 grand more than Toyota for the month. So that, that was a big surprise. But EV sales were down 10.9%, which is kind of surprising. Usually they'd be like kind of maybe flatline or up a couple percentage, right? So down 10.9%. This is mostly because of the Ford Mustang Mach E that lost its tax credit status the mm. first of the year. Uh, those sales are down 50%. So that was basically the, all of the, the change there. The Lightning was about equal, about the same as, as last year. So we're seeing that, you know, the effects of high costs, maybe range anxiety because of winter travel. People are more concerned about that in the winter. Maybe this the high rates, things like that that are affecting the, the, mm. the, the Mach-E. And the Mach-E Mach is three years old, too. It's not a new vehicle. So, you know, from that point of view, there's much more new competition out there that Ford is dealing with. I mean, it's so interesting to me because if the people, if people are not buying that vehicle because the tax credits went away, are they buying something else? Are they buying another EV? Or are they just still driving around what they were driving around before and they're not upgrading? Maybe they're waiting for another tax credit to come to effect. Maybe, uh, I, per, perhaps. We did see that, that for Ford, at least, hybrid sales were up almost mm. over 40%. The, the Ford Maverick, the, the compact pickup, which is a hybrid, doing really well at powering a lot of those sales. So maybe there's some substitution effect going on there with from the two different models. But I think that Maybe it's just a, a case of there's just not the right offerings out there mm. just quite yet. And the hybrid sales is also a trend we've seen at other automakers. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for yeah, sure. Interesting for sure. stuff. Yeah. Thanks, Pros. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Traders looking to get into the most, action, uh, most active stock options, they may face some of the biggest names driving the markets. And today we're going to walk through how to tackle these popular trades in the latest installment of Yahoo Finance's Options 101 Theme Week, sponsored by Tasty Trade. Joining us here to discuss is Daniel Shea, Simpler Trading VP of Options. Danielle, thank you for joining us here. Um, what, let me go to the Wi-Fi Interactive here so everybody can get on the same page. I was talking about some of the most popular options, and this is a snapshot a couple days ago. The seven most popular, and guess what? There's a lot of overlap with the uh, Mag7 here. Tesla, that's number one. AMD, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, Amazon. Uh, what do you think of this list here? How does it reflect what you're seeing in the options market and what's going on right now? So I love your list. I think this is a great starting point for options traders. And these are the top stocks that I trade every single week. The reason why they're great is because they have a lot of liquidity, which means you can get in and out of options positions. They have a weekly options expiration series. So that means that you can take advantage of trades on a weekly basis. And specifically, you can take advantage of premium decay as it goes into the end of the week. Um, and these are also the stocks that tend to be the most volatile in the stock market. So when you're trading options, you need to have some movement. And that's where it is. All right. And we're going to talk about a couple of uh, great examples. First, I want to bring the viewers up to speed with a definition. I know you like butterfly option spreads, and that's what we're looking at on the Wi-Fi Interactive here. And a couple of uh, highlights. They combine both bull and bear spreads. Um, you have basically two different spreads in each option. It's like a vertical spread, uh, two of those. They have fixed risk and fixed maximum potential profit, so that's capped. Spreads use four options with three three strike prices, and then there is an upper and lower strike price, which are equally distant from the middle at the money strike price. And a lot of words there. I think we're going to launch into an example. And here's your Microsoft example. This is a bullish call butterfly, butterfly spread where you buy the 410, sell the two 420s, and buy one 430 call. That's a lot of numbers. Can you break them down for us? Yes, definitely. So when you look at Microsoft, first of all, I love trading Microsoft. Microsoft just had earnings and it typically rallies after earnings. So with this trade, I'm looking at the stock and saying, you know what? I think Microsoft is going to trade up into $400, up into $420 a share. Uh, most likely next week. So how can I trade this? The reason why I like butterflies is because they're incredibly cheap, especially compared to a long call. With this strategy, I can get in for $224 a contract. That was my entry price on this. Um, whereas if I was purchasing a long call, 
I'd probably have to pay 800, 1,000, 1,200 dollars a contract, just depending on which strike you choose. So it's a really cheap way to get involved. And then the other reason why I like this is because of the risk to reward. So generally, you know, if I'm spending 220, 240 dollars, um, the max profit is generally about one to three, depending on where you get in. And so, you know, if you're risking $250, your max profits, maybe around 750. Um, and so with this kind of strategy, you know, if you're good at technical analysis, you're really able to utilize your capital. So you're looking at a range bound trade. Uh, you know, you're saying, I think Microsoft is going to be between 410 and 420, ideally as close to 420 as possible, but I'll take it if it's 415. And the prices are moving really quickly, as uh, we were noting in our email exchange earlier today. Uh, I wanted to give another example here. This is your trade in Tesla. This has a bearish bias. And if we can go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, I have it pulled up here. You're buying the 185 put, you're selling two 175s, and you're buying 165, the 165 put. Uh, just break down your thinking here, please. So with Tesla, Tesla's been weak and Tesla looks like it's ready to fall off a ledge at 185. So the way that I like to trade this is, you know, again, setting up a butterfly. In this case, it's a bearish fly. What I generally do is I buy the long option just at the money or slightly out of the money, which is how I get into the strategy for such a cheap price. So I was looking at this one right before I came on. It was going for maybe $1.74 per contract. So for less than $200 a contract, you know, you can get in short Tesla. If you bought just a put, I mean, it's going to cost you $800,000, obviously, depending on which one you buy. So for this trade, looking at, you know, minimum around $200 investment, and you can get about a one to four reward, you know, if that trades into your zone. And as I was saying, I don't need it to go exactly to the target, but I do place the center strike um, of the butterfly at my price target. So just looking for it to fall about $12. Uh, that's why I put the center strike of my fly at about 175 and it's a cheap, low risk, high reward way to trade Tesla to the downside in case it rolls over. Love that risk reward here with the butterfly trades. And you can even see the butterfly in those charts that were if you squint a little bit. But before we go, I got to ask you one question. I'm asking all of our options guests this week. What's your number one piece of advice for new options traders? So for new options traders, you have to start out small. You know, when I started, I was trading a $5,000 account, and that was the reason why I got into trading butterflies to begin with. I could not afford, you know, buying long calls on some of these really expensive names. So I would encourage traders to learn how to trade spreads. I know that it's challenging, and a lot of people say, oh, it's so over my head. Uh, but the reason why it's great, especially if you're learning, is because they're just so much more flexible. Uh, they're not going to move as much as a long call or a long put will because you can trade in a range bound manner. And you're also going to be able to risk a lot less money, which when you're starting out is very important because you want to hold on to your powder so that you can keep trading and live to trade another day. Exactly. Hold on to your powder. Most importantly, live to trade another day. Daniel Shea, thank you so much. Thank you. And stick around, more Yahoo Finance still to come.
Let's take a look at a recap of the markets after a jam-packed week of earnings and economic data. And let's look at the indices today. We see the Russell 2000 in negative territory, but for the week, guess what? It's still down about eight tenths of a percent, but kind of the flip here for tech as we see the NASDAQ composite up about 1%. And by the way, you're going to notice we took some deep dives on Wednesday. That was the FOMC announcement. So that is in the rear view mirror with all those jobs numbers today that beat expectations. Here's the S&P 500 up about 1.38%. And the Dow, which is a laggard today, is actually one of the highest, if not at 1.43%. And let's take a look at how this breaks down in sector action. And this is really impressive the way we see, and this is only today, communication services up 4%. For the week, we actually have it in second place, up 2.7%. So it had to claw back some losses today. In the poll position is consumer discretionary. That's an Amazon story. Tesla also in there, but it's been detracting recently. Then we have Staples in third place, healthcare and industrials, all of those outperforming. Before I move on, I want to take a look at the bond market because it has been a really roller coaster week. This is a two month chart. And last week we closed right here, just above 4.0%. We had some deep dives into negative territory and then we climbed back above 4% today. All of this is speaking to bond market volatility. And here's a ICE B of A move index. This is like the VIX for bonds. This is on the rise. And sometimes this spills over into equities as well. So not really affecting things today, apparently, but we will be on the move. We'll be on, a, on a, the lookout for that next week. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100 for the week. And I think this really paints uh, a pretty good picture of the week in earnings. Uh, Apple down 3%, Alphabet down 6%, but Meta, this is pretty much all today. Meta up 20%, Nvidia up eight, and so is Amazon as well. And taking a look at our leaders board where we have a bunch of different uh, parts of the market, guess what? Cannabis took the lead today, flying high up 7.8%. And then we have uh, New York Fang also contributing, Bitcoin in there, gambling, home builders. So pretty interesting swath here. What took it on the chin, regional banks down 7% in China. China internet stocks down 5.6%. Thanks, Jared. Well, Tesla CEO Elon Musk calling for a shareholder vote to transfer the company's incorporation to Texas from Delaware. That coming after a Delaware judge voided his nearly $56 billion pay package. The question many people are asking is why incorporate in Delaware in the first place? And as it turns out, it's very popular. Roughly two thirds of the Fortune 500 are indeed incorporated in Delaware. Joining us now is Ann Lipton, a Tulane law professor, to help us explain why and what it might take to move Tesla away from Delaware. And thanks so much for being here. Uh, I should say I'm an admirer of your work on Twitter and elsewhere. <laughs> um, and, you know, so how did Delaware get to be the place to, to incorporate? Um, it actually dates back to the early 1900s. Uh, different states offered different kinds of corporate law, and Delaware offered the most flexible corporate law. It basically made it very easy to incorporate there and do what you want with your company. Um, there were placed much fewer limits on what you could put in your corporate charter than other states did, and it became the popular place to incorporate. And after that, Delaware has worked very hard to maintain its position as a popular place to incorporate by creating a stellar system of courts to resolve business disputes and a very up-to-date corporate law that responds to the latest trends. You mentioned their judicial uh, system, and we got an inside view of how Chancery Court, uh, also with Musk and how Chancery Court operates when he was going through his battle to obtain or not obtain Twitter, now known as X. Could you just speak as to the way the Delacore, Delaware court system for corporations, Chancery Court, is a bit different than you might see in other jurisdictions? Yeah, so it's got this chancery court. It's a specialized court that hears all, the, uh, almost all the business disputes. It sits without a jury. There are uh, seven, ch one chancellor and six vice chancellors, so seven judges. Uh, they hear they are all experts in business law. Uh, they hear cases they uh, very very quickly. So they will actually go to trial very quickly, as we saw actually in the Twitter case. That case was moving along at, at lightning speed because the judges are so expert and because they sit without a jury, they don't need the time to parse things that uh, another court, a, a more generalist court might need. They are extremely well versed, obviously, in Delaware law. So they're very reliable in terms of understanding what the precedent is. You know what you're going to get. 
uh, after they've made a decision, it gets appealed straight to the Delaware Supreme Court. There's no intermediate appellate court, so that also helps with speed. And while the Delaware Supreme Court uh, handles the whole state, so handles things beyond business law, they handle all kinds of disputes that a state would hear, their uh, judges as well are extremely well-versed in corporate law. So you get quick decisions, reliable decisions, and a very consistent body of law. Does any other state have anything like this, either the set of laws or the chancery court sort of set up? No, I mean, no. Some states have tried. I think North Carolina set up a chancery court and Texas has announced that it's going to try to set up a specialized business court. But no state has really done anything like Delaware has, which has been investing in creating these, this court system for essentially over 100 years. Uh, uh, so, And because so many companies incorporate there, organize there, there's what we call a network effect, meaning that it generates so much law that it's very easy to predict what's going to happen, what the legal tests are for various kinds of scenarios. Whereas in other states, it's really uncertain. We don't know how their courts might deal with a particular kind of scenario because it's never come up. But with Delaware, we've just got this very thick body of case law to inform us as to how scenarios are likely to be addressed by the courts. Another state where it's become, or at least when I was uh, working on law about 20 years ago, had become popular was Nevada. And can you speak as to Nevada or any other states uh, which may be popular with shareholders for the ease with which you can file forms there? But substance wise, what are the differences if you're owning a company or you're a shareholder in Nevada versus Delaware or maybe even another state? Yeah, so Nevada is, uh, has, has set itself up as an alternative to Delaware in a very specific way, which is that it gets a, a lot more power to the managers, which is to say the founding shareholders, the insiders, uh, a lot fewer rights to the minority shareholders, to the public shareholders. And that's very attractive if you want to incorporate because you know that you won't have pesky shareholders bothering you. So they won't review conflicted transactions as closely. Shareholders don't have as many rights to get information from the company. Uh, but on the same time, that's perhaps less attractive to some investors because they know if they invest in a Nevada company, they'll have fewer rights. So, uh, in general, the choice of where to incorporate is kind of this push-pull because managers want a certain degree of flexibility and freedom, but they need to raise capital from investors, and investors may push back if they feel that their rights are not protected. So Nevada's carved out a little niche for itself, but in a sense of uh, penny stocks or stocks that it, 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 it kind of don't uh, inspire blue-chip investors to invest because they don't feel as protected. All right, Anne, let's bring it back to Tesla, shall we? Because what will it take, uh, besides a shareholder vote, I mean, what kind of cost are we talking about? What are the repercussions from changing your incorporation from Delaware to another state like Texas? Okay, so procedurally, um, the board has to adopt a resolution that they recommend the shareholders uh, reincorporate and they have to file um, forms because it's a publicly traded company there has to be a shareholder vote and they have to file all kinds of forms with the SEC with detailed information about why they're making this change and what the implications are likely to be uh, then you would hold a shareholder vote the I mean the absolute fastest I think this could unfold would be 40 to 60 days but it could easily take longer uh, you would have a shareholder vote and if the shareholders a majority vote in favor then you can just immediately reorganize as a Texas company and then you would be subject to Texas law uh, you know Elon Musk has something like 13% of the shares or so, so that's a good chunk of the way to 50%. But I think you know there's going to be some holdups there because the proxy statement would have to explain why they're doing this and exactly what the purpose was. And right now, the optics are not great for Musk and the board. And um, it's very possible shareholders would sue to say that this transaction itself was essentially intended to enrich Elon Musk and the board in a way that harms shareholders, and they may sue to actually stop the reincorporation from happening. Just like they just sued to get that pay package revoked. So uh, if you were Elon Musk's corporate attorney, would you advise him? I mean, are there advantages to doing what he's talking about doing besides him just being angry at the chancery judge? 
Well, it's very hard to say. I mean, Texas is in some ways sort of holding out its hand and like promising a more uh, forgiving corporate law. So I think Elon Musk is, Musk is expecting that if there are disputes in Texas, that um, he will come out more, you know, more victorious than he has so far. And maybe that's right. But the whole issue with Delaware versus Texas is that we have a very reliable set of law. We know what the standards would be in Delaware. And it's a bit hard to predict exactly what would happen in Texas. But to some extent, Texas has kind of promised him we're going to give you friendly judges. And obviously, Musk thinks that that's attractive. On the other hand, um, he's got a lot of big, you know, serious institutional shareholders who may not be happy with the idea of even having the shareholder vote, and they may push back. So I'm not sure exactly what his counsel is telling him, but it's definitely a risky move. But we, of course, just to even try it. I mean, he may lose the vote. On the other hand, you know, it's not like Elon Musk shies away from risky moves. So we'll see. Right. And we know he doesn't always listen to his counsel. And Lipton, <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Well, speaking of Elon Musk, he faces a new challenge in the race to become the world's richest person. Jeff Bezos is planning to sell as many as 50 million shares of Amazon within the next year, cashing in on the company's stock soaring following yesterday's earnings. Now, Bezos has not been tops on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, which a lot of people use as sort of the benchmark of this thing. He hasn't been number one since 2021. It's been so. a minute. And well, and we're just talking about this Elon Musk pay package, which is now under review. Right. Uh, this is something that could change the, the dynamics of this. Uh, but Bezos is uh, selling, I'm not, I don't remember offhand, how many billions of dollars, according to a plan that he filed with the SEC. Uh, he said he's going he's gonna to sell these amount of shares by January of next year. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to affect his net worth uh, unless the shares, I guess, really appreciated or depreciated in value before he sold them. What's really going on here is the value of the company. And we've seen Amazon overtake Alphabet as uh, in terms of market cap today. And Amazon is on the upward trajectory. Right. Tesla is on the downward trajectory, just in terms of share price. Yeah. So, well, I guess if he sold it right now, those 50 billion shares, mm -hmm. um, 50 million shares, excuse me, they would be worth about $8.6 billion at the current share price. So, yeah. but you're right, it's a matter of it on paper, right. all of it going up. I always wonder, like, if you're one of these guys, how closely are you watching the leaderboard? <laughs> I imagine there's I, a little bit of an eye on the leaderboard if you're these guys. Yeah, I'd be I'd be logging into Bloomberg and uh, checking my place in their billionaire's sure. pace each day. I think it's Rich, R-I-C-H. Well, not to give them too much credit there for having that, but uh, <laughs> let's move on. Coming up, we're going to go around the horn and check in on some of today's top trending stories, including Spotify locking up one of the biggest stars. Stay tuned for more Yahoo Finance. Still to come.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Alexandra Canal here with Proz Supermanian and Brooke De Palma. And guys, we're taking a look at some of the top trending, trending stories of the day. And we're starting with Spotify. Joe Rogan is signing a new deal with the audio streaming giant. The Wall Street Journal saying it's valued at up to $250 million, which would be more than his prior deal, which was rumored at around $200 million. But what's even more interesting to me is that through this deal, Spotify is going to distribute the podcast to other platforms. Mm -hmm. So that includes Apple. It includes YouTube, which is going to actually house the video portion of Joe Rogan's podcast. And before, this was a Spotify exclusive. So now we're seeing Spotify really look at all of their podcast deals. They made a ton of heavy investments. They've been pulling back on some of those investments in the name of profitability. And now they're trying to maximize the audience, but also the ad sales, right? That's yeah. really what they're going for here. So interesting to see the economics of podcasting mm -hmm. sort of shift. Yeah. I still think they're important. I still think people listen to them. Mm -hmm. But Spotify taking a different approach here. I think that Spotify made such a big play a few years ago and now, like you said, sort of pulling back a bit. One billion. They that's yeah. how much they invested. Wow. It's crazy. What it year really was that? Hit, that was a big It was over the course of four years, yeah. but it really hit their margins yeah. and that was something that investors didn't want to keep seeing. And then right. we had Daniel Eck, the CEO of Spotify, really focusing on a year of efficiency. Mm. And part of that was scaling back the podcast business. And now you're seeing the renegotiation of some of these deals, not just Rogan, but also Alexander Cooper's Call Her Daddy podcast as well. That's receiving wide distribution. Yeah, you know, I was a little surprised that when they went all in on podcasts a couple of years ago, right. really, really big deals uh, for the content creators. And, and we had thought about how the comparisons to like the, the Howard Stern's of the world and people like that, exclusive locking up deals, can they monetize? And apparently they're not really doing the best job monetizing it, so they want to kind of go broader, open up that licensing to other areas, which I think is what the YouTube deal, Apple podcast makes sense, you know? Mm. But it, it, it kind of makes me think about, you know, what about that, like the Patreon model, right? What about stuff like where people like Tim Ferriss, who I follow a lot, he had, he's fully solo. There's no deal, there's no, he's not using Spotify to, to co-license uh, uh, his content to, uh, they're, they're selling ads basically. It's a, it's a music business and they're selling ads. It's kind of weird, right? But I, I, th I have to wonder, can you have a big enough audience you need to do the Spotify deal? If you're Joe Rogan, can you just go on your own? Hmm. You probably could. I mean, he has such a big following. Yeah. But then again, you know, it's nice to have the backing of a company like Spotify. Yeah, it's not just they're going to distribute it for you and get the money up yeah, front. Yeah, yeah. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how much Spotify leans into these very specific characters, personalities in the next few years. So that's something I'm watching out for. And, and that's a big point, Brooke, because I think they want to have the big stars. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's really what they're yeah, going from for. From one consumer platform to another, we're talking Bud Light's parent company, AB InBev. It was a tough year in 2023 as it lost its top spot as America's favorite beer following a marketing campaign that then turned into a boycott, then a reverse boycott, causing shares to move lower last summer. But now as trading begins to turn the corner, it's facing a new challenge, guys potential strikes by members of the Teamsters Union, a potential walkout in March. So essentially this uh, contract does go up for a renegotiation February 29th, or rather expires February 29th, the same day as their earnings report. And essentially the Teamsters coming out today saying that it's bound to happen, that it's going to happen, but really AB and Beth sticking with this, the story that they are going, that they're willing to negotiate, they're willing to come to the table here, but this is just one of so many strikes we've heard of lately. No, oh, AB and Beth, man, they just can't catch a break. And the timing here too, I mean, just ahead of the Super Bowl, AB and Beth, a big ad buyer yeah. for the Super Bowl, and then in yeah, the background. Leaning at two and a half minutes, I think, they're between three different companies that they're putting out and this I'm year. And I'm sure it's very happy-go-lucky ads. Very and much then, so. you Easy know. to drink, easy Look to enjoy. That. Yeah, That's the, what they're trying. Yeah, they're Budweiser commercial with the Clydesdale. They're trying to get the nostalgia factor in you. And so they're really just trying to, to go back to the beer company the they were once known for. But, you know, and Proz, Proz and yeah. I have really uh, reported on a lot of strikes in our respective yeah. industries, the Hollywood strikes, the auto strikes. And I subscribe to the idea that there's strength in numbers here. Mm. When you see people in other industries fighting for their rights yeah. as, as a working the, the working class, I do think that ignites something and yeah. says, maybe we should do that. Yeah, and if they walk out, of, that means this summer, this summer, this spring, what does that mean for beer production? Right. I mean, the Teamsters got a huge one at the UPS last yeah. year. And then you couple that with what happened with the UAW and on SAG and WGA. 
you're seeing these unions sort of like, they're winning at every level. Mm -hmm. And popular opinion is with labor versus management. So I don't see how they can not do this, right? They're saying that they're not coming to the, they're not coming to the table. They're, they're threatening job cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently that's, that's what the union's saying about, about AB InBev. Yeah. They're not gonna agree with that. They're gonna say, no, we're, give us what we want. All are gonna go on strike and we lose 5,000 workers and Super Bowl's coming up and all yeah. sorts of stuff. And 99% of people, or 99% of the union actually voted to authorize strike last year. So. Yeah, and this comes on the same move as Constellation Brands gaining share here with Corona, that light lager beer. In addition to that, we're also watching Molson Coors also gain share. So it'll be interesting to see the way that this all plays out as and ABM really tries to stay, come out back yeah. on top. Yeah, it seems like the power is, is in the workers right now. If there's yeah. a time to strike, it might be now. Yeah, and they're going to need some shoes to wear when they do strike. So, <laughs> a story I'm looking at is Lululemon as they step into a new territory launching a men's footwear line. Coming this spring, the new men's collection will offer up casual sneakers called the Cityverse, a running shoe models that are dubbed Beyond Feel and Beyond Feel Trail. This, as the company looks to double its men's wear business by 2026. Where is Josh Schaefer? Get out, get over here, man. I know he's buying these shoes. He literally is right there he's looking the at pants. the pre-sale. I know he's buying the shoes, he's hiding out over there. I think but, he went in on the pre-sale. That's, that's why he's not here today, actually, he's, he's in because line. he's buying. He's in line on Lafayette shoes. Street, right. But, but here's the thing, like, I guess if you're a buyer of the pants, like the shoes are a no-brainer, mm -hmm. but for me, uh, I'm already, I got Nike, I got New Balance. Why do I need to buy these shoes? That was a big yeah, question How do they mark bring you me. into the market? The saturation, I think it's a very smart play to go in yeah. on the menswear. Lulu yeah. has been growing a little more slowly. They yeah. really have captured the attention of females with the crossbody bag. But yes, yeah. looking at some of these pictures here, looks like every other men's yeah. white sneaker yeah. out there. And I'm just wondering how they can differentiate. Themselves. I will say they have a black model with a nice gum gum sole. that looked pretty Ooh, cool. Gum sole. Oh, gum yeah, sole. gum sole. Yeah, gum sole. Yeah. I, I was surprised. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I saw all the white ones. I thought these are boring, but yeah. maybe I'm wrong. But Lulu, this doesn't do for me as a sexy that shoe being brand. Said no, that they, maybe it will eventually. I mean, we've seen a turn around. They love the ABC casual. Pant. Yeah, they love the ABC pants. This trend, casualization, vibe that's now going on post pandemic. This is something that maybe they needed to get into in order to have that full capsule of different apparel. We, we're seeing on also get into apparel. They of course started with shoes, and so this really is this complete feel and look that maybe men can now and go the to brand, learn for. The brand has a hold on the on the men's, on the, on the males <laughs> out there. Some men, but they have women's shoes, right? Don't they? Yes. Yes, but to me, Lulu is not a it's known for, I feel like in, in, in females' perspective, head. it's yoga yeah. pants. It's known for that I just got a yoga bodysuit that That's I- That's also trending. That, which I really loved, Ooh, a yoga know. mat. That's sort of the <laughs> direction <laughs> that I feel. My Lululemon yoga mat, I do, but, I do. But guys actually get those the outfits Similar, yeah. to go to work yeah. and yes. do those things. I think Lulu needs like kind of like a transformational technology, like a, a, a mm. like the Adidas Boost, right? Something yeah. that'll make that's you want idea. to come to the brand. Otherwise, it's such a saturated market. Yeah. All right. Wall Street, though, is loving shares of Lululemon. They're up major year over year. All right, well, we are running to the next commercial break to end our Friday. Coming up, we have what to watch next week, and we're going to be breaking down the top stories that you need to know to kickstart your Monday. Happy weekend.
few big names reporting next week, including McDonald's, Eli Lilly, Disney, Philip Morris, and PepsiCo. Disney in focus after the close on Wednesday as it faces a host of issues, including an activist battle with Nelson Peltz. The company also trying to boost profits by cracking down on password sharing across its streaming services, Hulu, ESPN Plus, and Disney Plus. Moving over to the Fed, we're going to be hearing from a slew of Fed officials after Fed Chair Jerome Powell's news conference on Wednesday, where he basically took March off the table for a rate cut. And speaking of Powell, he's going to be making an appearance on CBS's 60 Minutes on Sunday to further discuss interest rates and inflation. And uh, this is something that we're going to be talking about quite a bit here. Also looking at the economy, mo monthly data for the Purchasing Managers Index, a measure of economic trends and services coming out Monday. Economists forecasting no change on that front. The January survey from the Institute of Supply Management expecting to tick up, giving us more insight into business activity for the overall economy. Thank you, Jared. Oh, uh, next week, I'm watching to those Disney earnings that we mentioned. That password crackdown is going to be really interesting because Netflix did it. In, uh, yeah. That's what I was going to say, and it worked for Netflix. Yes. It worked in its favor. I mean, Disney can kind of—I won't say it's in the kind of straits where it can use all it can. It needs all the help it can get, but obviously, it has been embattled. Yeah. as of late, right? So streaming, we'll be watching that closely. Parks should hold up pretty well. It always does, um, seemingly. Seemingly, it has been in pretty good shape, but we'll see how those streaming numbers look. Yeah. I mentioned 60 Minutes. That's what I'm going to be watching. This Sunday, Jerome Powell is going to be on, and I got to tell you, this has not happened that that many times in history. I think the first was Bernanke in 2009, just a couple days before announcing Bazooka QE. It was a landmark. Powell last did this in May of 2020, I believe. And there have been a couple other instances. I think Yellen was on a panel with Bernanke and Powell in 2019. But this is a big deal. And I don't know that there's anything as big as Bazooka QE or the mm. pandemic on the, on the you know, on to the, be discussed right, right. on the agenda. But nevertheless, uh, I'll be watching. Me too. All right, oh, that'll right. do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Guess what else you should be watching? Us on Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a great weekend.